Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing today? I hope you're doing remarkably well. I am too, feeling fighting fit and strong. So I hope you are having a lovely day or evening and don't forget to get that quintessential drink, whether it's Irish coffee, pink lemonade, red wine, white wine, whether it's diet cola, go and get it because I've got a fabulous story for you tonight. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Bernard and my story begins in the 1990s when I was working for the United States Postal Service where I would deliver post parcels and packages to a large area around the bluegrass state of rural Kentucky using my postal carrier van as a means of transportation as many of the country farmhouses where I dropped off post were acres apart. The only area where I walked on foot was around the quaint rural town where the shops and apartments were built rather close together. As a result of my job, I was as fit as a fiddle and certainly didn't require any gym membership. And it always felt good at the end of the long day to see my previously heavily packed carriage now emptied of everything, which always gave me a good feeling that I had accomplished my goal for the day. I assure you, I thoroughly enjoyed my tranquil, relaxing drives through the spectacular, verdant, scenic vistas of rural Kentucky, which in itself was an uplifting experience for me. I would drive past gorgeous farms, pretty barns, silvery lakes, and fenced-in areas of emerald green pastures with grazing horses, sheep, or cows. I also loved watching the changing of the seasons from the windscreen of my vehicle when the countryside was swathed in carpets of glistening white snow like a glorious winter wonderland, where the icicles dangled off the trees like delicate crystals. Then the cold, harsh winter days would slowly recede, which for me was always promptly announced by the showy arrival of the inflorescent lavender flowers from the eastern red budwoods that burst into bloom on their heyday before their summer leaves began to sprout. So yes, I loved my job as a postal worker, most especially the wonderful people that I would meet. As for many, I was an ever-constant in their lives, and the familiar, amicable and friendly face many began to trust. Of course, I had special customers who gave me candies, cookies and presents. One of these endearing people was a delightful woman called Eleanor Markham, whose husband had recently died from a long drawn-out illness. So now widowed, she was living on her farm alone and her two sons were more than a little eager to turf her out of her farmhouse and encourage her to move into an old age home, but that was the last thing Eleanor wanted to do. She would always express her misgivings, reservations and trepidations to me over a cup of hot tea. I could never deliver post to Eleanor without her insisting that I took my tea break at her home, which became a customary thing for me to do, as Eleanor was a matriarch figure in my life and I genuinely enjoyed and appreciated her effervescent company. Better still, she made the most delicious chocolate brownies that you've ever tasted in your life that were quite frankly awesome and impossible to resist, unless you were a saint, which I most certainly was not. It was on a Wednesday morning when I was driving down the precipitous dirt road through Eleanor's large cattle gate with the farm name Cedar Tree Hollow attached to a large oak tree. My postal carrier wobbled and shook precariously as I drove towards the large 1800s farmhouse that stood proudly on the land like a wizened old friend. I parked in the paved driveway and saw the familiar slender sprightly figure of Eleanor standing in the doorway of her home, eagerly awaiting for me to accompany her for my usual piping hot cup of tea. I smiled happily to myself because I warmed to Eleanor. I could tell as I strided over to her on this lovely spring morning with the post in my hand that she was looking very unsettled and somewhat discomposed. Come in, she said, pushing me through the front door, bobbing her small head of grey curls to the left and right, glancing over my shoulders with her earnest blue eyes, almost as if she suspected we were being secretly scrutinised in the shadows by a pair of unseen eyes. Eleanor swiftly placed her hands on my back, pushing me forwards down the entrance hall into the living room where the tea was already prepared for us, as I could see the steam rising from the teapot, and there was a huge pile of chocolate brownies on an elegant Royal Dalton plate ready to be devoured, and I was more than a little eager to oblige. I placed down the large handful of letters on the upholstered chair and wasted no time in grabbing a brownie. "'Is everything all right, Eleanor?' I asked, taking a large, scrumptious bite of my brownie. 
Forgive me for saying this, but you do look rather unsettled this morning, and you're acting quite perturbed and disquieted, if you don't mind my saying so. What is troubling you? That is because I am unsettled, young Bernard. Thank you for noticing, she said, looking at me with troubled eyes, that displayed a measure of vulnerability that I'd never ever discerned before. I watched her hands wobbling precariously as she poured me my tea and handed me a piping hot cup. Thank you, I said. Come on, Eleanor. I need to know what is bothering you. I can sense something is really up, and I'm not going to leave until you tell me what it is. You know the saying, a problem shared is a problem halved. So go on, tell me what's bothering you. Well, you know how I've been telling you that my two boys have been trying to turf me out of my farmhouse. Oh, that, I said. Well, you know exactly what I think about that, Eleanor. No one can force you to do something you don't want to do. This is your house, and you're the rightful owner. You can do with it as you want. You might be in your eighties, but I can see you're as fit as a fiddle, and you're physically very well and coherent. You can stay here as long as you like, until you feel differently. Besides, I do have my own secret agenda, I joked. For you staying around my postal jurisdiction, that is. Because I enjoy our little chats, Eleanor. And let's face it, no one makes better brownies than you do. That's so nice of you to say, Bernard. That's why I really love having you around. You're so respectful, reverential and courteous, which is more than I can say for some people around here like my two scheming boys, who both seem to have stepped up their duplicitous little game with me. And it's getting nasty, said Eleanor. Very nasty. Sorry, Eleanor. But you've completely lost me. What do you mean it's getting nasty? And what have your sons done this time? I suppose I shouldn't ask that question, but I'm going to anyway. I have never admitted this to anyone, said Eleanor, and I'm ashamed to have to acknowledge this about my own flesh and blood. But while I love my sons, I've never ever liked them. Do you understand what I'm actually saying? You love them, but you don't like them. I meditated on the words, trying to make sense of them. Sorry, Eleanor, it sounds like a contradiction in terms. What exactly do you mean? My two boys are impudent brats, despite the fact that they're fully grown up, said Eleanor. There's no kind way of saying this. To put it mildly, they've always been in trouble with the law and still get up to all kinds of unsavoury shenanigans, and I assure you they would stop at nothing to get what they want, and they're now employing very dubious actions to get me to leave this house of mine, and what's even more appalling is that they have no clue that I'm on to their devious charades. They really believe I'm naive, dim-witted and ignorant, a silly witless old bat that has no clue as to what really is going on. Why are they so eager for you to leave? I asked her, looking bewildered. It's not because they have my best interest at heart, if that's what you're thinking. Theo, my eldest, has an insatiable appetite to move into this farmhouse with that dreadful hen-pecking wife of his, and to hoggishly take over this farm of mine, using the profits for his own self-indulgent pleasures, with only a small portion of the income used to cover the costs of my care at an old age home. Their father would be turning in his grave to see their abysmal treatment of me. My audacious boys even had the shameless impertinence to send Pastor Josh Miller around to the house to try and encourage me to leave this farm. You know, that large man with the round podgy face and piggy eyes buried beneath mounds of flesh? Oh, him, I laughed. What did he have to say? Well, after eating over a dozen of my brownies washed down with four cups of tea, he had the irreverent audacity to tell me that given my great advancing age and the physical degeneration of an aging body, that my sons were absolutely right and I should consider moving to an old age home forthwith. What a cheek, I said. You're so young for your age and as active as any youngster I know, maybe more so. I said to him, Pastor Josh, age is just a number and I assure you that I'm in perfectly good health. And if you don't mind my saying so, it's a little like the pot calling the kettle black, because you're a fine one to give me advice. If you were in perfect health yourself, I might listen to you more. But I did notice that you were out of breath walking from your car to the living room, which means you're dreadfully unfit. I also noticed that you have high blood pressure. Well, I've heard about that. 
fatty liver disease and diabetes, not to mention you are definitely obese. Looking at you at a guess, I would say you're approximately 500 pounds. How dare you come here lecturing me on moving to an old age home based all upon my age, not on my health at the bequest of my sons, when you should take a long hard look at yourself first. Oh my word, Eleanor, I'm impressed with you. I bet you that did not go down too well. How did the pastor react? Not very well, I'm afraid. He went red in the face and said that he hadn't come here to be insulted by me and that he was leaving at once. I said, good, and don't come back, Pastor Josh, unless you have something sensible to say or you want to read the word of God to me. Otherwise, be gone from me. She continued, you see, I'm in the fight of my life, Bernard, against my own guileful sons who've been trying to scare me witless as their final ploy or tactic, if you like, to get me to leave my beloved farmhouse when I'm in perfect health, as you can see, and not in need of any physical assistance or care. Scare you, I said. You never said anything about that, Eleanor. Why would your son scare you? That is a seriously unkind and insane thing for them to do. I was coming to that part of the story. You'll be surprised, Bernard, dear, how low some people are willing to stoop in order to get their own way even if it means scaring their mother half to death in the process. My oldest son, Theo, who's over six foot tall, lanky and well built, has been dressing up in an ape costume. He's been running around my backyard in the middle of the night, banging on the wooden rafters to wake me up. I see him pressing his face against the window, squashing his large nose against the glass so it smudges the whole pane, and he promptly proceeds to make some ridiculous fake grunting sounds. And I know it's him. I could recognise him anywhere, based on his build and size. He's not fooling anyone, least of all me, and doesn't scare me one little bit. On the contrary, it disgusts me that he's behaving in such a juvenile fashion. I was stunned at this appalling revelation, and astonished at the lengths that Eleanor's son was going to, in order to scare his own mother out of her home. As for dressing up in an ape costume, that was rather insane and ridiculous. Eleanor was no fool, and anyone with a grain of intelligence knows that we don't have apes wandering around our backyards in North America, especially not human-looking gorillas like Eleanor was describing. I mean, the costume is a dead giveaway, said Eleanor. Theo is dressing just like a human in an ape suit, and is barely bothering to disguise his human-like face, which he covers in a large layer of tan shoe polish. I absolutely know it's him. I wasn't born yesterday. And I'm not a complete idiot. So did you call him out on this prank? I asked Eleanor. No, of course I didn't, because either way I stand to lose, don't you see? If I claim to my boys that I saw Theo dressed up in an ape racing around my backyard in the middle of the night and banging the sides of my house trying to scare me, he'll deny it, of course. And then they'll both have grounds to have me committed, claiming I'm delusional and have the first stages of Alzheimer's disease, or I'm losing my mind. As that never happened, they'll deny it, of course. That will give them all the ammunition they need to use against me, to make me leave this house of mine, and I'm not having them doing that to me. If I call the police, and they arrest Theo, when I'm grousing up my own son, and I don't want to do that, do you not see how delicate the situation is for me? I think I do, I said. How often is your son dressing up and acting as an ape? Well, he's been pulling off the stunt every night this week at about twelve o'clock. Who knows what he'll do next? He may possibly pretend to be a ghost, but if I was giving him any advice, I'd tell him to go and get a better costume. I wouldn't put anything past him. I'm not remotely scared of any of his tactics, but I am inconvenienced by being woken up in the middle of the night like this. I have an idea, I said. I'll have to run it over with the wife, of course, but how about I stay at your house overnight? so that I can be a witness as to what is going on here, and we can get to the bottom of this incredible situation that you have going on. If you're sure you don't mind, said Eleanor, that would be so appreciated. At least I'll have a witness as to what is going on. And so it was that I slept overnight in the very elegant spare room at Eleanor's home, and about ten past twelve I was awoken to a loud rattling sound, as if something very big was banging the sides of the house, and making a huge thunderous commotion. 
On hearing this, I sat bolt upright in bed, filled with an overwhelming sense of disgust. It was inexcusable and repugnant that Eleanor's own son was trying to scare the poor old woman like this just to get her to leave her farm. It was a cruel, heinous and atrocious thing to do, and I wasn't going to let Theo get away with this insidious little act of his. No, I wasn't. I could see that Eleanor was in the hall, clad in her dressing gown and slippers, and was pointing at this huge, hairy creature staring in at her through the window. I did not want to be seen and observed by Theo, so I cautiously hid behind the couch and took a peek at him very closely without him discerning me. He appeared to have his face glued to the window, which was a huge giveaway, and he was making some strange, very peculiar grunts that were way too over the top to be believable. I manoeuvred my body carefully and cautiously behind Eleanor's furniture, crawling and sliding along the ground like a snake, until I reached the entrance hall. Then, on two feet, I tiptoed into Eleanor's large kitchen and stealthily pushed open the back door. Then, standing close alongside the wall, I followed it until I reached the far side, where the critter was hunched down, staring in at Eleanor through the window. I knew it was Theo. I could see him clearly, as Eleanor's outside light was gleaming brightly. I immediately pounced on Theo, pressing my weight on his body and holding him down as hard as I could. You think this is a joke, boy? Scaring your mother half to death like this? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. And get the silly ape suit off you. It's not fooling anyone, least of all me. I tried to pull at the hair on the body, and to my astonishment, I realised it was real. I was gobsmacked. Suddenly a light bulb illuminated my consciousness with a blinding revelation. This was not Theo, I realised in astonishment. This beast was a living, breathing being that was so remarkably human that it was almost uncanny. Granted, there were powerful ape-like influences, most poignantly seen in the long, shaggy, dark hair that covered the body, in what I'd initially believed was an appallingly bad ape suit with overlong arms and a pyramid-shaped head that surrounded the human-like face like a hairy cape. The critter appeared confounded, especially since I'd pounced on him so unexpectedly. For a second he stared at me with disbelief and astonishment. He seemed dumbfounded. He regarded me with his deep-set eyes, seemingly staggered that I dared to challenge him. Obviously this was not something he was used to. He pushed my body violently with his overlong arms, with such a brutal savage force that I fell backwards onto the ground on my back, where I found myself staring up at this anomalous critter's dark eyes, which in certain lights beheld a very distinct red eye shine that was exceedingly menacing. By this time I was terrified. My heart was pumping so fast while my adrenaline was surging through my body like a steam train. I realised that whatever this creature was, it was without doubt an apex predator and with little effort, much like swatting a fly, it could easily kill me. I knew I was in perilous danger, but staggering back onto my feet was not even an option for me, as my body seemed almost superglued to the ground, because I simply could not get up. I watched in horror as the critter curled back his lips to reveal a glistening white pair of large teeth, and then it let out the most terrifying growl, and I assure you this ominous sound was far more intimidating and threatening than the growl of a lion. By this time I was shaking, and before I could think of anything, the critter lunged towards me with one of his legs and kicked me so hard that I could hear the bone in my upper leg crack, and I knew I had broken my femur. I was certain the creature was going to unleash several more kicks upon my crumpled form, but instead it glided away towards the woodland area on Eleanor's land, only glancing back at me once, and then vanishing from our sight. To cut a long story short, the ambulance arrived shortly after that incident, and I was admitted to hospital with a broken femur. Of course I never told anyone what had really transpired. I received many concerned visits from Eleanor, who was desperately worried about me, and shocked to have discovered that the really bad-looking ape suit did not belong to her son in disguise, and was in fact a real creature but we had no idea what it was at the time. We chose to tell no one about our spurious encounter for fear of being ridiculed and disbelieved. But all these years later, I know that we encountered a Bigfoot, and to think that I actually pounced on this creature boggles my mind to this very day, 
as it was possibly the stupidest thing that I've ever done in my life. I truly consider myself lucky to have escaped with my life, because the power of this mighty beast was unquestionable. But I assure you, if you didn't know any better, you could easily be fooled into believing the Bigfoot was a man in an ape suit. Looking back, I do not know why for an entire week that this Bigfoot was making such a raucous commotion outside Eleanor's farmhouse and staring in at her by sticking its face to her window and watching her curiously with a transfixed intensity that I shan't forget in a hurry. Eleanor was never afraid, as she falsely believed the creature was Theo, and maybe her lack of fear gave the Bigfoot the confidence to study her more intently. I truly believe these creatures are as fascinated by humans as we are by them. On reflection, I believe it was a youngster that was curious about humans because the Bigfoot I saw was only six foot tall, 400 pounds, and about two and a half feet wide across the shoulder area. I noted it was very well built, lanky and lean, much like Theo is, and even the face reminded me of Theo, although it did have a beard around the chin area, and leathery grey skin, and of course a large flat nose. It possibly knew Eleanor lived on her own, and saw her as an easy human subject to study. That's why he was so curious about her. I'm glad to inform you, though, that the creature never came back to bother her again. It would seem that Eleanor's biggest fears never came to pass, for she didn't end up living in an old age home after all, which was an idea she despised and totally dreaded. She lived out the last days of her life in her farmhouse until one day she didn't wake up. She died in her sleep at the grand age of 97, still in robust health and sound mind, which in my opinion is the very best way to go. Now that I know I saw Bigfoot, I always hope for another random encounter, but I'm of the opinion that you'll only encounter a Bigfoot when you least expect it, and not when you're intentionally seeking him out. So there you are. That's my story. What a fabulous story. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, goodbye and good night.